This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 50. Coming up on Space Time, the Martian dust storm grows global. A rare pulsar glitch captured from the Vela pulsar for the first time. And Juno solves the 39-year-old mystery of Jovian lightning. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New data from an armada of spacecraft at Mars has now confirmed that a massive dust storm on the Red Planet has gone global. Last week, the growing storm, which at the time was covering about a quarter of the Red Planet's surface, had forced the suspension of science operations by NASA's Mars Opportunity rover. The thick dust in the storm was blotting out the sun, preventing the golf cart-sized six-wheel rover from using its solar panels to recharge its batteries. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Red Planet, NASA's Mars Curiosity rover, which uses nuclear batteries and so remains unaffected by the worsening dust storm, is continuing to monitor the growing storm and providing fascinating data for scientists. Though Curiosity is on the other side of Mars from Opportunity, the dust has steadily increased over it, more than doubling in the last few days. The sunlight-blocking haze, known as Tau, is now above 8.0 at Curiosity's Gal Crater site, the highest Tau reading the mission has ever recorded. Back to the other side of Mars now, and the Tau was measured near 11 over Opportunity, thick enough that accurate measurements were no longer possible for Mars's oldest active rover. For NASA's human scientists watching back on Earth, Curiosity's offering an unprecedented window to answer some interesting questions. One of the biggest is why does some Martian dust storms stay small, lasting only a week or so, while others can last for months and grow massive enough to become global events? Atmospheric scientist Scott Gerswich from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, admits researchers don't really know, at least not yet. Gerswich is leading the Curiosity rover dust storm investigation. The car-sized six-wheeled robotic rover together with a constellation of orbital spacecraft, have been carefully studying the Martian dust storm as it grew in size to officially become a planet-encircling or global event. For the first time, scientists have been able to collect a wealth of dust information both from the surface and from orbit. The last storm of global magnitude that enveloped Mars was back in 2007, five years before Curiosity landed in Gale Crater. The new observations captured by Curiosity's cameras show the sky getting progressively hazier and more reddish every day. The sun-obscuring wall of haze is about six to eight times thicker than normal for this time of season. Meanwhile, Curiosity's engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, are studying the potential for the growing dust storm to affect the rover's instruments. They say the Martian dust poses little risk, with the biggest impact being on the rover's cameras, which require extra exposure time due to the low lighting. The rovers already routinely point their cameras down to the ground after each use to reduce the amount of dust blowing at its optics. Of course, Martian dust storms are common on the Red Planet, especially during the Southern Hemisphere's spring and summer seasons, when Mars is closest to the sun. As the atmosphere warms, winds generated by larger contrasts in surface temperature at different locations mobilise dust particles no bigger in size than individual grains of talcum powder. At the same time, carbon dioxide frozen on the winter polar caps evaporates, thickening the atmosphere and increasing surface pressure. This in turn enhances the process by helping to suspend dust particles in the air. In some cases, the dust clouds can reach up to 60 kilometres or more in elevation, Though they are common, Martian dust storms typically stay contained to one local area. By contrast, if this current storm were happening on Earth, it would be covering an area bigger than Europe and Asia combined, stretching from Portugal across Russia almost as far as Alaska. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have captured a rare glitch in the usually regular clockwork-like spin of a pulsar. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, provide new insights into these rapidly spinning stellar corpses, which are composed of some of the most exotic material in the universe. Pulsars are rapidly spinning neutron stars, the crushed stellar cores of stars at least eight times more massive than the Sun. Scientists describe stars as being in hydrostatic equilibrium. For you and me, that means they're a balancing act, 
between the immense gravitational forces of the star's own mass trying to crush everything inwards down towards the star's centre and the explosive outwards force of nuclear energy generated at the star's 10 million plus degree core as the extreme temperatures and pressures there cause it to fuse hydrogen atoms together creating helium and in the process releasing the energy which makes stars like our sun shine. Astronomers like to describe stars fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores as being on the main sequence. But eventually the hydrogen in the stellar core runs out, and the gravity, no longer held in balance by the outwards push of nuclear fusion, begins to crush down even harder on the star's core. At this point, the star is said to have moved off the main sequence. At the same time, a shell of hydrogen just outside the core now begins to fuse into helium, increasing the core's mass as the shell produces more and more helium. This causes a dramatic increase in the temperature and pressure in the core, eventually reaching a point called helium flash, during which the helium in the core begins fusing together into heavier elements, such as carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. The energy generated by this process causes the outer atmosphere of the star to expand and, being further away from the core at the centre, the outer surface of this atmosphere cools down a bit, causing it to look more reddish. The star is now said to have entered its red giant phase. For stars like the Sun, once the core helium has been fused into carbon and oxygen, the star will die. That's because these stars aren't massive enough to generate enough gravity to crush the stellar core down any further and so this prevents the carbon and oxygen from fusing into even heavier elements. With nuclear fusion ending, the red giant stellar core begins cooling and contracting, separating from the star's gaseous envelope, which eventually drifts off into space as a colourful planetary nebula. What's left behind is a white-hot superdense core of carbon and oxygen called a white dwarf, about the size of the Earth, which will slowly cool over the eons of time. However, stars at least eight times more massive than the Sun are destined to suffer a very different fate. They have enough mass to crush the stellar core down even further, resulting in the fusion of progressively heavier and heavier elements to occur, until eventually iron-56 is produced in the stellar core. And that's where the story ends, because no matter how massive a star is, it can't generate enough gravitational pressure or enough energy through nuclear synthesis to fuse iron-56 into heavier elements. Now, if the mass of the core of these stars is greater than about 1.44 times the mass of the Sun, the so-called Chandrasekhar limit, what's known as electron degeneracy pressure will be unable to support the weight of the star against its own gravity. Electron degeneracy pressure is best explained by the Pauli exclusion principle as preventing two identical fermions, that is half integer spin elemental particles, such as electrons, quarks, neutrinos, muons and taus, from simultaneously occupying the same quantum state at the same time. With this electron degeneracy pressure broken, the core of these stars will undergo a sudden catastrophic collapse, generating a core collapse supernova, an explosion bright enough to briefly outshine an entire galaxy. What's left behind from this cataclysmic event is a rapidly spinning object barely 10 kilometres wide, known as a neutron star. So called because these objects are so dense that all their positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons have been crushed together to form neutrons. Neutron stars have surface temperatures of around 600,000 degrees and are the densest known objects in the universe, other than black holes. In fact, just a matchbox full of neutron star matter has a mass of over 3 billion tons. If the neutron star's magnetic poles and spin axis are out of alignment, the powerful jets of electromagnetic energy generated by the magnetic poles will sweep across the sky like the rotating beams of a lighthouse. And if seen from Earth, just like the lighthouse beacon, these beams will appear to rapidly pulsate on and off, and the neutron star is then called a pulsar. Now, these pulsars usually spin at extremely consistent rotational rates. So accurately, they're now being used to time atomic clocks. However, occasionally pulsars will experience a sudden and abrupt change in their rotational rate, known as a glitch. About 5 to 6% of pulsars are known to glitch, the most famous being the Vela pulsar. Discovered back in 1968 and located some 958 light years away in the southern constellation of Vela, the sails of the ship Argo Navis. The neutron star was created by a supernova about 11,000 years ago. The pulsar emits radio, optical, X-ray and gamma rays, rotating some 11.195 times every second, making it what scientists call a millisecond pulsar, and one of the fastest spinning pulsars known. 
but roughly once every three years, the Vela Pulsar suddenly speeds up in rotation. These glitches are unpredictable, and have never been directly observed by a radio telescope large enough to detect individual pulses, at least until now. And that's where our study's lead author, Jim Porfreyman, comes in. He's from the University of Tasmania. He's actually caught the individual pulses involved in a glitch. Porfreyman says studying the glitch gives scientists a first-time glimpse at the mysterious inner workings of a neutron star. Using the university's 26-metre Mount Pleasant Observatory near Hobart, Porfreyman collected data on the Vela Pulsar for more than four years. Then, finally, on December the 12th, 2016, at approximately 9.36pm, he received an automated text on his cell phone telling him that Vela had glitched. And surprisingly, what had actually happened wasn't what he expected. The glitch happened when the Pulsar suddenly missed a beat. It literally didn't pulse. And the final pulse before the missing beat was also unusual. It was broad and weird, unlike anything ever seen before. The two pulses following the glitch were also strange, having no linear polarization, which was unheard of for Vela. Now, this means the glitch must have been affecting the strong magnetic forces driving the emission from the pulsar. And the strangeness didn't end there. Following the missing beat, a train of 21 pulses arrived early, and the variance in their timings was weirdly a lot smaller than normal. Paul Freeman thinks the glitches could indicate that neutron stars are composed of a hard crust and a superfluid core. He says the outer crust is what slows down, while the superfluid core rotates separately without slowing down. Between the two are complex microscopic superfluid vortices underpinning from the crust's lattice. After about three years, the difference in rotation between the core and the crust gets too great and the core grips the crust for about five seconds, causing it to speed up. Paul Freeman says the data collected through these observations could help scientists better understand the equation of state, how matter behaves at different temperatures and pressures, at levels which could never be created in a laboratory on Earth. The Vela pulsar is what I was looking at. It's uh, the brightest pulsar in the sky. It's the second closest. And it's got a lovely feature, which, you know, it's, it's close and it's bright, but it also does this other amazing thing is, is it glitches. So I mentioned they probably start off spinning, you know, 50, 60 times a second when they're born, and, uh, but they gradually slow down over time. And the Vela pulsar, though, every, uh, as a few other pulsars, about 6% of pulsars do this, but the Vela pulsar is interesting. I mean, roughly every three years, and we can't predict it, it glitches, and that means it speeds up in its rotation. So Imagine sitting there watching a spinning top slowing down, slowing down, and all of a sudden it's sped up. You'd have to think, well, what's happened there? So this glitching, even though it's the, it's a very close pulsar, it's a thousand light years away, it's a very bright pulsar. In, in radio, it's bright. It's very faint optically. Uh, it's very bright in uh, X-rays and gamma rays, though. But every three years, roughly, we can't predict, it speeds up. Now, We've known about this for a long time. The Vela Pulsar was discovered fairly soon after pulsars were discovered, which was pretty much close to 50 years ago. The anniversary just recently passed. And then uh, shortly after the Vela Pulsar was discovered, it glitched and the two observers caught it separately. And they both got a paper in Nature for that. The reason for the glitch has always been under discussion for a long time. What are some of the theories about, about what's causing the glitch? The initial one was they thought that as the star was slowing down, it would be if it was fast, it would be in the shape of a, a sphero, an oblate spheroid, sort of a flattened sphere, if you like. Imagine getting an orange and squashing it from the top. And they thought that it was as it was slowing down, it would be cracking back to a spherical shape, and you have these little star quakes, and it would crack back to those, and that would change the rotational speed. But they worked out that it would, if that was the case, it would take. Um, it would be many, many years, hundreds of years between glitches, and that didn't quite work. But back in the, uh, I think it's about in the 70s, some theorists came up with an idea that we, we have the, imagine a neutron star as a hard crust on the outside, but a superfluid core on the inside, and that the superfluid core and the outer crust rotate separately, completely sort of independent of each other. And what happens is as the, the neutron star is slowing down gradually, it's the outer crust that slows down, but the inner core is spinning, spinning at the, the same speed. And then after a certain amount of time, the, and in the case of Vela, approximately every three years, the difference between the core and the crust is too great. And then the, the, the core sort of, you can imagine, grips the crust like a clutch, if you like, and speeds it up. It's much more complex than that, but that's a, a sort of a, a straightforward explanation as to what's going on. The inner core sort of grabs the crust and 
transfers angular momentum to the crust and it speeds up. Now the key thing here is that no one has actually observed a glitch happen with a large radio telescope, large enough to see the individual pulses of the pulsar. It's been observed before a number of times with only small radio telescopes and we didn't get enough detail as to what, going on, what was going on because we couldn't see the individual pulses. All we could deduce was that it happened in under a under 30 seconds or under 45 seconds. It was just a bit unclear. So what I, with a bit of tenacity, managed to do was to get some decent amount of telescope time to try and catch this this glitch. And it was the 12th of December 2016, 9.36pm at night, and I was getting ready to, uh, it's 9.36pm local time, I was getting ready to go to bed, and uh, I got the text message on my phone telling me that the, uh, the pulsar had glitched. Now, occasionally I get I'd set up all this software to calculate the arrival times and occasionally get some glitches, pardon the pun, in my software due to radio frequency interference. And so I took it with a grain of salt at first. I thought, oh, no, I better check it out. So I logged on and did another test to see if it had glitched, and it had. And the second test came through, it looked like it had, and I got really excited. So I ran a third one, and that, again, showed it was true. So I thought, no, it's happened. And so I uh, I actually pulled an all-nighter that night, having having a look at what happened while the glitch occurred, and some absolutely fascinating stuff occurred. What did you see? It's almost what I didn't. See. Okay, so we have our pulsar or our neutron star rotating and it's pulsing. And what just at the time of the glitch, what happened was it actually stopped pulsing. It missed a beat and uh, completely, like it was like a flat line. It was just the pulse just was not there. And and then the pulse before turned out to be really broad and strange and different. And I've never seen a pulse like it before. And since then, I've actually, and myself and some students, uh, we've done some searching, looking for broad pulses like that weird one and have not found it. So it's fairly unique too. Uh, and the two pulses following the null, and I'll call it a null, I'll talk to you about that in a minute, were very strange with regards to their polarisation. And uh, so we had four pulses in a row that were just like completely weird. And that Vila spins 11 times a second. It, it, it supernova happened 10,000 years ago or so. So it slowed down a little bit. So that's, you know, 10, 11 times a second, four pulses. We're, we're approaching, you know, half a second or not quite half a second, but but that's a long time in, in pulsar land. And so something really strange happened. And to explain this, we have to ask ourselves, well, the timing is about the magnetosphere, which is the sort of it's like the atmosphere that surrounds a pulsar, and that's where the the uh, radio emissions come from, and it's like that's been affected, and that's what the paper's about. And to affect the magnetosphere, the magnet that's the massive magnet that the neutron star is seems to have been affected by the glitch. And this, for the first time, gives us an inclination of what might be happening inside the neutron star itself. What do you think's happening inside the neutron star to cause this this null and uh, the, and these strange pulses? Str- yeah, it's look. That's an open question. I want the theorists to dive into this and have a, a bit of a look and see what they can come up with. What we sort of think is that the actual glitch process of transferring the core to the crust took probably a bit under, just a fraction under five seconds, which was on the quicker end of the scale. Because this affects what's called the equation of state, which is how matter behaves in temp- various temperatures and pressures. And of course, a neutron star is the most ridiculous temperatures and pressures pressures that we can really observe directly. We can never create them here on Earth. And so it gives us an understanding of how matter behaves. This is an observation of what happened. The glitch happened fairly quickly and possibly about 45 seconds later, according to what looks like to be the timings on the on the plots. It looks like that that's when the core and the crust sort of disassociated themselves again and started rotating separately. Now, there's a whole stack of information that can be gleaned from those those pieces of data. And again, learning about what's inside a neutron star and how matter behaves under these incredible temperatures and pressures is hopefully something we can uh, we can glean from this. What does this tell you about the internal structure of a neutron star now? Are, are we still going with the superfluid? And, and if so, what's the superfluid made out of? Is it is it purely neutrons or are there quarks, free-floating quarks in there as well? So, yeah, all big questions which we don't really know the answer to, but this result does support the concept of the superfluid rotating and and then you know if you like gripping the crust, I, I can dive in a little bit more and, and explain that when you rotate a superfluid, and you can literally go to YouTube and see videos of superfluid helium doing this. It's quite interesting. The fluid itself doesn't really rotate. 
it stores its angular momentum in, in microscopic vortices, which you know, think of them as little whirlpools, but the fluid itself doesn't rotate. Now, these vortices, what happens is they pin to the, the edge of the structure of the outer crust of the neutron star and they stick to it and they sort of hold the angular momentum. And then what happens over time is what's called the Magnus force, which we all know, actually, if you look at a, a if anyone's ever hit a golf ball or kicked a soccer ball or whatever, they curve or um, swung a tent a cricket ball, they curve in in the air and that's called the Magnus force and that force once it gets big enough and that happens after about three years in Vela uh, we think that sort of separates pulls the vortices unpins them if you like and then when that happens the angular momentum transfers from the superfluid core to the outer crust but yes to answer your question yes I, I think the observations that we have observed does support the new theory that came up in the 70s I believe about the superfluid vortices and the superfluid core that's Jim Porferman from the University of Tasmania I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Ever since NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft first flew past Jupiter back in March 1979, scientists have wondered about the origins of Jupiter's lightning. That encounter confirmed the existence of Jovian lightning, which had been theorised for centuries. But when the venerable explorer hurtled by... The data showed that the lightning-associated radio signals didn't match details of radio signals usually produced by lightning here on Earth. Now, a new study reported in the journal Nature claims that while Jovian lightning is in some ways quite analogous to Earth lightning, the two types are poles apart in other ways. The study's lead author, Shannon Brown, from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says no matter what planet you're on, lightning bolts act like radio transmitters, sending out radio waves whenever they flash across the sky. But until the arrival of NASA's Juno spacecraft, all the Jovian lightning signals recorded by spacecraft, such as Voyagers 1 and 2, Galileo and Cassini, were all limited to either visual detections or from the kilohertz range of the radio spectrum. And that's despite a very thorough search for signals in the megahertz range. Many theories have been offered up to explain this discrepancy, but no one could ever really get any traction on an answer. And that's where Juno comes in. Among its suite of highly sensitive instruments is the microwave radiometer. It records emissions from the gas giant across a wide spectrum of frequencies. Data from Juno's first eight flybys have detected some 377 individual lightning discharges, recorded in both the megahertz and gigahertz range, which is about what you'd expect to find with Earth lightning emissions. The authors think Juno is seeing the signals in ranges beyond those of earlier spacecraft detections because it's flying so much closer to the lightning than the other probes were. Now, while these revelations show that Jovian lightning is similar to Earth's, the study did find some stark differences. You see, on Earth, most thunderstorm activity happens near the equator, but on Jupiter, it appears to occur nearer the poles. Scientists think that's because Earth derives the vast majority of its heat externally from solar radiation courtesy of the Sun. And because Earth's equator bears the brunt of the sunshine, warm, moist air rises through convection more freely there, which fuels towering thunderstorms which produce lightning. Jupiter's orbit is five times further from the Sun than Earth's orbit, which means that the giant planet receives 25 times less sunlight than the Earth. But even though Jupiter's atmosphere derives the majority of its heat from within the planet itself, this doesn't render the Sun's rays irrelevant. See, they do provide some warmth, heating Jupiter's equator more than the poles, just as they heat up Earth. Scientists think that this heating of Jupiter's equator is just enough to create stability in the upper atmosphere, inhibiting the rise of warm air from within. The poles, which don't have this upper-level warmth and therefore no atmospheric stability, allow the warm gases from deep within Jupiter's interior to rise, driving convection and therefore creating the ingredients for lightning. But the new findings still leave one question unanswered. Even though we see lightning at both poles, why is it mostly recorded at Jupiter's North Pole? Meanwhile, in a second Juno study also published in Nature, scientists have provided the largest database yet of Jupiter lightning-generated low-frequency radio emissions, events astronomers call whistlers. The study, led by Ivana Kolmosova from the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague, contains more than 1,600 signals collected by Juno's wave instrument. That's almost 10 times the number recorded by Voyager. Juno's detected peak rates of four lightning strikes per second, similar to the rates observed in thunderstorms on Earth, and six times higher than the peak values detected by Voyager 40 years ago. Still on Juno, and NASA has approved an update of the spacecraft's science operations until at least July 2021. 
This provides an additional 41 months in orbit around Jupiter, enough to enable Juno to achieve its primary science objectives. Juno is undertaking 53-day orbits of Jupiter rather than the 14-day orbits initially planned because of concerns over valves on the spacecraft's fuel system. The longer orbits mean that it takes more time to collect the needed science data, so extending the mission is a way to make up that lost time. An independent panel of experts confirmed that Juno is on track to achieve its science objectives and is already returning spectacular results. NASA says the Juno spacecraft and all its instruments are healthy and operating nominally. The end of primary operations are now expected in July 2021, with data analysis and mission closeout activities continuing into 2022. Thomas Burchin from NASA's Science Mission Directorate in Washington, D.C., says the new funding will allow Juno to continue answering the long-standing questions about Jupiter which first fueled the mission. And it will also allow scientists to investigate new puzzles, motivated by Juno's newest discoveries. Juno Principal Investigator Scott Bolton from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, says the updated plans will allow Juno to complete its primary science goals. And as a bonus, the larger orbits allow further exploration of the far reaches of the Jovian magnetosphere, a region of space dominated by Jupiter's magnetic field, including the far magnetotail, the southern magnetosphere, and the magnetospheric boundary region known as the magnetopause. Juno was launched on August 5, 2011, from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida aboard an Atlas V rocket. The spacecraft was designed to study the chemical composition of Jupiter's immense atmosphere and cloud structure, peering deep down into the clouds to monitor the convection currents and the thermal engines driving its circulation patterns and its spectacular surface weather features, cyclonic storms and iconic salmon and cream coloured atmospheric bands. Juno is also measuring Jupiter's gravity field to better understand the internal structure of the solar system's largest planet, as well as its magnetic field, its polar magnetosphere and its auroral activity. The probe will search for a rocky Earth-sized core deep down in Jupiter's heart and see if there's an exotic metallic hydrogen mantle surrounding it. Jupiter contains more mass than the rest of the solar system other than the Sun combined. So, by better understanding how the Jovian gas giant formed, scientists will learn more about the formation of the rest of the solar system as well. The 3,625 kilogram probe achieved Jovian orbit insertion on July 5, 2016. Juno was placed into its highly elongated 53.4 day polar orbit so that it could avoid as much of Jupiter's damaging radiation belts as possible. This orbit allows the probe to swoop down and skim just 4,200 kilometres above the swirling Jovian cloud tops before being taken back out to a perigee of more than 8.1 million kilometres away. To further protect the spacecraft from Jupiter's deadly radiation, Juno's most delicate instruments and control systems are housed in a specially shielded strongbox. The original plans called for a total of 37 orbits around the 143,000 kilometre wide planet. And as we mentioned earlier, the original 53.4 Earth Day polar orbits were eventually designed to contract down to just 14 Earth Days. However, those plans were scrapped following concerns about a valve on the spacecraft's main engine fueling system. This meant that all orbits would remain at 53.4 Earth Days, which would have meant far fewer overall orbits in the time allotted. The good news is that Juno has coped well with Jupiter's extreme radiation belts, far better than expected and it's that which has allowed this mission extension to proceed. By extending the mission, those missing orbits can now be included. Juno will make its 13th science flyby of Jupiter's mysterious cloud tops on July the 16th. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. There have been lots of studies showing that having two standard alcoholic drinks per day was actually better for your health than having more, or not drinking alcohol at all. A new study has found that averaging just under one drink per day is even better. The findings, reported in the journal PLOS Medicine, indicates that light drinkers had the lowest risk of dying or developing a number of cancers. The study's lowest drinking category was an average of less than one drink per day across a lifetime and the risk of some cancers increased with each additional drink per week. The new findings could help change existing public health guidelines, which currently recommend no more than two standard drinks per day. 
A new study warns that Russia's dysfunctional medical system and a distaste for Western AIDS prevention strategies are contributing to a growing HIV epidemic across the former Soviet Union. The findings reported in the journal Science show that St. Petersburg is one of the very few places across Russia where infection rates are dropping. Representatives from UNAIDS claims much of Russia has treatment coverage levels just half of that found in Zimbabwe. A new study claims that koalas' diets are at least in part determined by the bacteria in their microbiome, that is, the microbes which inhabit their gut. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on faecal transplants between populations of koalas that normally eat different varieties of eucalyptus leaves. Scientists found that koalas who undertook the procedure had their microbiome altered, making them more willing to expand their diet to include other species of eucalyptus. The findings are important because it means transplants could help vulnerable koalas adapt to changing environments. In the movie Back to the Future, an eccentric scientist creates a time machine that runs the device called a flux capacitor. Now, a group of Australian and Swiss physicists have proposed a device that uses quantum tunnelling of magnetic flux around a capacitor, breaking time reversal symmetry. The new electronic circulators, devices that control the direction which microwave signals move, could be a crucial component for next-generation technologies, including quantum computers and ultra-low-energy electronics. The research is reported in the journal Physical Review Letters. Developers at Apple have used the eye-tracking capabilities of the company's new iOS 12 operating system, due to launch in September, to control an iPhone using just your eyes. As well as improving the lives of people with disabilities, the new software will have a myriad of hands-free applications. With the details, Alex Sahar of Reut from IT Wire. This is at the Apple WWDC, the Worldwide Developer Conference, and I had lots of new things, new operating systems coming in about in September for the watch, the phone, the computer, and the, the TV box, Apple TV. And one of the features is AR Kit 2. So AR is augmented reality. They launched that last year. This is the second version of the programming kit. And one of the developers who got there on a scholarship looked at what AR Kit can do and des designed. Uh, he, you know, he knew that you could actually use the uh, true depth sensor that maps maps your face to track your eyes and track facial movements because you can also do it with those animojis that look like they're taking on your movements. He decided to have three buttons on the screen, big buttons, and because he's using the front-facing camera, you could see a picture of him in the screen. And he created a video, it's on Twitter, where he's looking at these different buttons and black laser beams are coming out of the image of him on the screen. And when he blinks, he clicks one of the buttons. It's just a demo, but it would mean that we could have eye tracking or face tracking to go up and down web pages. You wouldn't even have to touch your screen on your phone, for example, if this was implemented into other software. And and Samsung tried something like this back with the Galaxy S4 where you could move your eyes or your head to move pages up and down. But it just used the regular camera on the front of the phone. It was nowhere near as sophisticated as the 30,000 dots of infrared light that the true depth sensor shows. So, What happens if you sneeze? <laughs> well, I mean, you could use this for drones and especially with the other brain control technology, you could be piloting things. Imagine spaceships piloted with these sort of just by thinking and by, you know, using facial movements. But if you'd sneezed, or just like you've got palm rejection on uh, tablets where you put your palm on the paper and you're trying to write it, sort of ignores your palm movements, you'll have to have sneeze detection of some sort. And theoretically, the system should figure out that you're about to sneeze and disregard that information. But yeah, that's a problem they're going to have to figure out. Is this different from uh, what Apple are about to introduce now, which basically allows you and whoever you choose to do whatever augmented reality games you want to using Together. your iPhones? Yes. Look, it's I mean, the AR technology, what Apple launched here is that two or more people can be using their iPads or iPhones yeah. to be playing in the same AR environment. So you're overlooking a space battle or building something or doing something like Minecraft, and you're all playing together, which wasn't possible. And some people could just be watching. So, look, the, yes, I mean, it's using the AR did the same too. thing, and there, was a bit, uh, there were a few problems with that because people were treating it too casually, and as a result of this, they were mapping their houses and all this, and all that was then on the cloud where anyone could sort of access it with the right well, codes and Look, bit, bit Google scary. does things... Google does things in a different way to Apple. Google is trying to take all your information and learn from it as quickly as possible to try and become really useful and hopefully one day figure out the privacy problem, whereas Apple is doing privacy from the very beginning. And, you know, things like your fingerprint or your face print never leave the device. They're not stored by Apple. People think, oh, they've got my fingerprint or my face print. No, it's on the secure enclave on your device. I mean, there's two forms of this reality besides the current reality. And there's actually a term called mixed reality as well. But virtual reality is when you put your headset on and you can't see the outside world. Augmented reality and mixed reality.
reality, generally speaking, is where you can see the outside world. I guess you want to be able to make it virtual by pushing a button if you wanted to. But yeah, you can recreate build- your office and even everything in your office, including what's on your computer. That's right. You could. You could be seeing that in total virtual reality, even though you're in your hotel room, sitting at the desk in your hotel or yeah. somewhere else. So absolutely. But augmented reality is going to come a time, and it's probably going to come you know, next decade, sooner than rather than later, where to interact with the world, to be able to see all this extra information about train lines, about shops, about people, about every aspect of your life, is going to be putting on a headset and seeing a different world. I mean, the same world you are looking at now, but with all this information available to be uncovered without cluttering your entire viewing space with Google ads or, or stuff. But you can sort of, you know, virtually... That's what everyone's scared about, isn't it? That every time you walk past the shop, there'll be an ad coming from that shop, whether you intend to go to that shop or not, the ad's going to sure. be there. Well, look, I mean, perhaps that's going to be the case on, on uh, Android devices, but on Apple devices, you would presumably have the ability to say, look, I'm going to be able to switch all that off and just look at stores if I want to. If I'm looking at a store and I blink my eye or tap my you know, gesture or wriggle my nose or tap the side of the thing or whatever it is or just speak you know, or think, then it's going to say, okay, well, this is a certain store and they sell all these things. Here's the stuff inside. I mean, I can sort of look at it all quickly and easily. It's kind of like a floating web page in space, I guess. And in, in so some will point, I be able to look f- at somebody and say, ah, that's Sarah Connor Skynet? Huh? Well, you would. You would. And some of the information that's publicly available, stuff that's obviously still private in the modern era, well, you'll have to have a balance. You can't walk around with ads floating in space. You know, this thing will be there to help you, not for you to help it. You'll be at a party. You'll recognize somebody, you know, you'll wink or blink or think and whatever it is, and up will pop information about that person. But it'll be in such a smooth, stylish way that it'll sort of just look like it's meant to be there and equally as quickly just by thinking all that information is gone. What was the problem with Google Glass? The problem was that it was just too early. I mean, you know, you only had one lens uh, on the one eye and it was showing you arrows or pointers. It's not like looking at the smartphone screen in front of you right now. It had very, very basic information. And these devices are going to have to be sleek. They're going to have to do very high resolution. They're going to have to have long, month-long battery life, the very least day long, but it's going to have to be great battery life, and they have to be smoothless and seamless. And I don't think that the technology to make these things perfect is going to be necessarily solved soon. It might take till 2030s before it's perfected. But, you know, they already started with the various headsets and things like Google Glass and, you know, the Samsung's Gear VR and the Oculus headsets. And I find augmented reality incredibly addictive. It, once I'm in there, I'm in my element, so to speak. I don't want to leave. Uh, is, is that a problem? Problem for people generally, or is it just? Yeah, me? well, look, the, no, no. The, there's there's obviously an addiction to these uh, online worlds. Even those things from 20 or 30 years ago. I remember being inside of a VR machine and you stood yeah. inside this ring and you looked and you shot dinosaurs. I mean, this is all the primitive stuff. Just imagine how smartphones were 10 years ago and the ones we have today. Well, just imagine what uh, the very primitive AR, VR stuff and AR stuff we have today and what we're going to have in 10 years. Alex Sahara of Reut from ITY. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 